Hello everyone and welcome to The Build Show. I'm John Peitzman, JP, Certified High Performance Coach and Creator of The Build Framework. I help individuals and teams all over the world thrive in their personal and professional lives. And as your host on this show, our aim is to help transform lives one guest at a time. And how do we do that? We do that by having amazing guests. And today is no different. We have with us Skip Cummins. Skip is the creator of Mastering You from the Inside Out and has been there, done that, when it comes to extraordinary successes and achievements, devastating tragedies, and spectacular mistakes and failures. As CEO of a medical device company, he took an organization that was basically bankrupt and transformed it into one that provided and created over $1 billion in shareholder value. That's one billion with a B. <laughs> He's a gigantic personality and he holds the distinction of receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Epilepsy Foundation while simultaneously being labeled as the most combative CEO in all of America <laughs> by a Wall Street TV personality. So I'm sure he won't be combative today because he's among friends. I'm so happy to have him with us joining from the United States of America via video technology. Skip, welcome to The Build Show, my friend. Thank you, JP. It's great to be here. I've yeah. never been to Australia, so now I feel like I'm there. Well, you're welcome anytime, my friend. You just got to figure out a way to get here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Figure right. out a way to get allowed in, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's that too. So what, what are you excited about as, as we sit here right now today? Well, the thing that I'm most excited about is if ever there was a time when we all need to master ourselves from the inside out, it's right now. Amen. Considering all the powerful outside forces that are trying to master us from the outside in. Tell us what we have to think, what we have to do, what we can't do, what we can't think, et cetera. So now's the time to master you from the inside out. Right, and we're gonna talk about that and dive right into that. I can't wait for this, this conversation. Uh, we have such similarities in our coaching styles and abilities and uh, of how we you know, help people and, and just that insight that, that comes from you. And again, I just wanna thank you for all that you've done. I've you know, just finished your book again and, and the tragedies and, and things that you've gone through and, and anyone who you know, thinks they've had it rough, read Skip's book. I mean, from a mom who's been suffered, suffering with, you know, depression growing up and commits suicide to a, a daughter who gets murdered at 32. I mean, I, I can't imagine the, the pain and suffering. And I just, again, want to thank you from my heart for kind of putting that all out there and helping people kind of go through their own personal journeys because of the lessons that, that you've learned in your life. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome, JP. And right back at you. Needless to say, everything that you share in the build framework is, is equally as important and impactful on people's lives. So right back at you. Well, well, thank you for that. And, and as you know, we kind of use the BUILD framework as a model to have a conversation. That's what I love about this show is that even though the BUILD framework is consistent, all the unique stories and insights from the guests around the world are completely theirs, right? And unique, so it hits people in different ways. So for those of you who still don't know what BUILD stands for, it's an acronym. B is for build relationships. Then we have you understand the business. I is implement strategies, L is lead and inspire, and D is deliver excellence. So let's just kick it off with, you know, the foundation of it all, B, build relationships. So I know we could literally talk all day about this one <laughs> topic, um, but let's spend a little time on it anyway. And, and that is, you know, in relationships being so important in your life. And like you talk about, you know, the relationship with yourself and, and mastering yourself from the inside out, which is all that you help people do. What, what are some relationships in your life that were the most key, do you think, or that are the most key in that category of building relationships? Well, what's interesting is I was thinking about that in anticipation of our chat today. And the first relationship that came to mind was the one with my mother, who was a drug addict and very depressed, et cetera, et cetera, which really represents the majority of my origin programming. Because what I learned from my mother is that my needs don't matter. And that I had to basically give everything to try to get some love and attention in return. So in essence, that relationship made me a codependent and caused me to subordinate my needs my entire life to the needs of others. So I was thinking, okay, that's the most important relationship. But then I, then I thought to myself, wait a minute. That relationship and that origin programming didn't cause me 
to make all the mistakes that I made later in life. It was the relationship that I had the issue with was the relationship with myself Mm. because I didn't understand the significance of that origin programming. And I was the one who made the decision not only to not understand it, but then not do anything about it. So what's the most impactful relationship in my life? My relationship with myself. Right. And I love that in the book you talk about, you know, understand from whence you came, right? So knowing, you know, your origin programming and all that you have, because you're right. And as I talk about in the build front, without awareness, right, we don't have any knowledge to do anything about it, right? So it's all about understanding that. And when you understand from whence you came, like that relationship um, with your mom, that it's interesting too, because most people think about the context of relationships as, oh, the thing I learned to help me the most from a positive standpoint, right? Not a relationship that might have taught me like what not to do or, or added some negative kind of or, or, or struggles in another way to put it, you know, in your life that you had to overcome. But I think that that's a really good insight for people to understand too, that sometimes the most key relationships are those relationships that taught you how not to be or, <laughs> or programmed you in a certain way that you have to understand to use your words from whence you came so that you can then apply that relationship with yourself to actually do something about it. Right. But when you think about it, so if I go back to my relationship with my mother, what's the positive lesson that I should have gotten from exactly. that? Exactly. The positive lesson is one needs to create, maintain, and enforce healthy boundaries yep. and respect the healthy boundaries of others. Right. Which can come from a relationship that wasn't positive, although you have a positive lesson that comes out of it. Exactly. Exactly. You always have to look for the silver lining in the dark clouds. Yep. I know that's true. And, and I assume the relationship now with yourself, too, is that an ongoing, important priority in your life, even though you've been through so much transformation already? Oh, yeah, because, you know, I, just like for you, JP, you write the build framework, right? So there it is in black and white. So when you feel yourself going off track, it's like, uh, well, why don't you go back and read the book you wrote? (laughs) It's the same for me. So now I have this manifesto of life where I've documented everything I know now that I wish I knew then that I paid dearly to learn. So now I have this manifesto. And when I start going back to the, you know, the old stuff, it's like you wrote a book. (laughs) So why don't you go and read the chapter on, you know, pick your battles or yep. whatever else and refresh your memory of what everything that you learned the hard way so you don't keep repeating it and keep paying the tuition for that. So, 100%, oh, yeah, 100%. yeah, it, it makes life a lot easier. But but needless to say, you can't get away with much because the book keeps staring you in the face. Absolutely. In a way, I mean, I recommend in a way everyone do that, whether they publish it or not, but that they, you know, write some sort of journal like a book. Right. So you have it so you can learn the lessons and know what you want to know from those trials and tribulations that you've been through. Otherwise, we are just condemned to repeat patterns. I mean, I did for, you know, several, several years before I actually learned the lesson. And we're all, I think, kind of conditioned to do that without that awareness that then allows us to transform. So um, yeah, amazing insight there. If we move on now to you, understand the business, right? There's so many understandings of the business. I know, again, that could be a whole nother show in and of itself, but what, what comes to mind now that you'd like to share with our listeners about the topic of understanding the business? Well, I mean, for me, it's more than just business. Mm. It's, it's because business is life and life is business. Yeah. The business of life. (laughs) Yeah. So for me, it's understand who your customers are, understand your product, understand that the most important thing that you can do in business or in life is to create and be a fully informed buyer. Yeah. So in relationships, people are selling you ideas or relationships, whatever. Well, you need to be fully informed as to, okay, what product is being sold to you, why it's being sold to you, how it's being sold to you, and whether or not that, pra- that product satisfies your wants and needs and you can afford it. So those are the most important things to me in business and in life. Understand your product and your product could be you. Your product is always you. One of the things I've, 
I've often asked people is, okay, are you in sales? Oh, no, I'm not in sales. Really? So you're not selling yourself every day, personally and professionally. Oh, well, yeah, maybe come to think of it, maybe you're right. Yeah, of course, we're all in sales. And at the very least, we're selling ourselves. So understand our product, strengths and weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses understand who our customers are, understand what relationships, to quote, you know, JP, understand what relationships are necessary to effectively sell the product to the customer and understand what strategies you need to employ to do that. And one of the things that at Cybronics, the medical device company you referred to that I ran, that I kept telling our sales force is, look, in order to create happy customers, you have to meet their expectations. To do that, you have to not only sell what your product is, but if you think about it, you have to sell what your product isn't. Right. Because that, that's the way you create realistic expectations in your customers. So that's what I would say in terms of, you know, understanding strategies is what your product is, who your customers are, what their wants and needs are, and then how to go about creating fully informed buyers, which will result in happy customers whose expectations were met. And what do happy customers do? They refer other potential buyers to you and they buy more from you. Yep. And, and I love to how you talk about in the book being, in an, being in an, an informed buyer, right? And how you were sold um, an exit from cyber, right? Um, that uh, in hindsight, you weren't really an informed buyer of that, right? Um, so yeah, you want to share a little bit about that? I think that's a really interesting story from, from your book. Oh no, well you go back to medieval times and that's where the expression pig in a poke came from. A poke being a bag. So in the old days, in the medieval times, people would go to market and they'd say they had a pig in the bag and they'd sell it to somebody. And where, where cat out of the bag comes from is oftentimes when the buyer didn't look in the bag because they trusted the salesperson and they went off and opened the bag to get the pig out to have a nice dinner. What was in there was a cat or a dog. Right. So, you know, don't buy a pig in the poke. And in, in other words, understand exactly what you're buying and the motivations of the person trying to sell it to you. And in my case, you know, my board put the bums rush on me. Oh, you need to resign. And, and uh, no, we're not going to show you the, the options report that they paid two and a half million dollars for on and on and on. Oh, the SEC will take it easier on you. <sighs> that was all BS. Because what I should have said to myself is, wait a minute, in my contract, if I did something wrong, they can terminate me for cause and pay me nothing. Well, why were they in such a bum's rush to get me to resign and negotiate my severance if I really did something wrong? And I never thought that way. I just trusted them. And I bought the proverbial pig in a poke, <laughs> which, you know, only cost me $50 million. But ah, what's $50 million between What's $50 friends, million right? dollars amongst friends? Right, exactly right. But what I love about that story is that sometimes we're not, you know, everyone thinks about being an informed buyer when you're buying something, when you're actually putting money on the table, right? And you're actually buying a good or a service, right? Because that makes sense. But in that case, I mean, it's really evident that you have to be, you know, an informed buyer when you're making choices, any choices, right? And people are selling you a decision that they want you to make, which might not be an investment of I'm giving you money for a product, right? Um, but it's also very important, if not even more important sometimes, to be an informed buyer in that case and know what their motives are, right? And really what, what the intention is from that side so that you can make, make the right decision. And like you said, if you knew then what you knew now, <laughs> then it would be different, but now you do. And now we all do. And thanks to you, a lot of other people do around the world too. So that's, that's amazing. Thanks for that. Exactly. Um, so BUI, implement strategies, right? So what are some, you know, kind of amazing strategies that you implement in your life, either personally, professionally, or both that you'd like to share with the audience today in the category of implement strategies? Well, <clears throat> on implementing strategies, one of my favorite quotes is, and, and one of my board members from Cyberonics attributed to Bill Gates, but I can't find anywhere where Bill Gates said it. But the quote goes something like this. What gets thoroughly planned frequently measured, frequently reported, 
and appropriately rewarded gets done. So in other words, step one is to implement your strategy is create a plan, a very thorough plan. And what I've discovered is the more difficult the task, the more important it is for you to create a plan consisting consisting of a series of small, doable steps that you can achieve. Right. And a classic example that I think I mentioned in the book is I was helicopter skiing one time and we came to this seldom. I love that, by the way, helicopter skiing. You just kind of say, oh, yeah, one of the times I was helicopter skiing, which is amazing. So they take you up in a helicopter and they drop you off on the top of a mountain. That That's the only way to get there. Right. And then you ski down, hoping that you don't die. Well, is that basically there's helicopter a guide. skiing. There's a guide leading you, hopefully, in a direction where you're you both won't die. Right. Yeah. There you go. So the, this one time uh, we were helicopter skiing, we went to this thing called anniversary shoot. And it's like this 6,000 vertical foot, you know, 50 degree pitch that they seldom ever ski because it's really dangerous. And they thought it was fine. <laughs> so I remember standing on this 20 foot cornice, you know, looking down like, Oh my. And all of a sudden, the rigor mortis sets into your legs like, oh, my God, because you're looking all the way to the bottom. No, you can't do that. What your plan has to be, and eventually I got there, is I said, wait a minute, where am I going to make my first turn? So that becomes your plan. One turn leads to the other, leads to the other, leads to the other. Next thing you know, you're at the bottom of the 6,000 feet that you thought you could never, ever ski. But you did it because you had a plan that consisted of a series of small doable steps. And to continue the original quote, okay, you've got a thorough plan, then you frequently measure, you report it within the group that you're working with. So there's accountability, and then you appropriately reward it, or there are consequences for not achieving it, and you change your strategy. So that to me is is ultimate. What gets thoroughly planned, frequently measured, frequently reported, and appropriately rewarded gets done. You got it. And not to throw out quotes there, but from the build framework, it fits into that, which is measure what matters with meaningful metrics, right? Exactly. I mean, it's like, that's it, right? Because that incorporates everything that you talked about, which is looking at, you know, the understanding that the metrics that you measure drive the behavior, right? I mean, you were looking at the next turn. So that drove the behavior of being focused on that, right? If you would have looked at the end and freaked out, then that would have driven the behavior probably of wiping out, right? And or death, right? Because right. it's where your focus is. And the other thing about, um, and we did this at Cybronics. <clears throat> and also this sort of comes from my experience, race car driving. Sorry. I know. Helicopter, just, just drop these things in. It's like helicopter, skiing, race car driving. And you were, by the oh, yeah. way, because I read the book. It's, I right, it's the right behind me. Where, where and you, you were can't. actually a professional race car driver. By, and and yes, I love this, not, not to throw dollars around you, but you mentioned in the book so I can say it, which is to say that you know it's an expensive hobby when you go for a weekend and it's $100,000 <laughs> to go to enter the race. And, it's like, if I only knew then what I know, what I know now. now, exactly, I wouldn't be blowing a hundred grand a weekend for a, a car ride. But anyway, so anyway, yes, tell me, you know, at, at Cyberonics, we created this sales process. There was a series of about seven different steps taking uh, the process from the creation of a fully informed patient and doctor to ultimate implant. And there were about seven steps there. And just like race car driving, we not only measured the outputs, which were sales and unit, you know, implants, but more importantly, we measured the inputs, i.e. what was happening in each of those seven steps, which drove the output. So right. to me, and that, that's when I read your book again, that's just hit me. It said, oh, yeah, what's important to measure are the inputs not the outputs. And, you know, classic story I have is I was one of the first uh, athletes in a long time to qualify for the NCAA track championships from Dartmouth. So of, of course, course you were. <laughs> my, my coach, my coach, the weight coach was the, the assistant coach. So he didn't go. So the running coach and cross country coach who was the head coach went to the meet. 
So I was, I remember I was struggling and this and that. So I went over to the, to my coach, right? And this, you'll love this coaching story. I said to him, coach, what am I doing wrong? And you know what wisdom he imparted upon me? <laughs> Tell me. You're not throwing it far enough. Oh, thank you, coach. I now know what I need to do differently. There's a classic example of he's coaching outputs. Well, why don't you tell me what inputs I need to change to throw it farther? Right. Oh, no, you're not throwing it far enough. So you got to coach yourself. You have to define the inputs that generate the preferred outputs, coach yourself, and then set up metrics that coach the whole group to achieve the desired output. Love that. And what would you say? Because, you know, the build framework in life is about, as you just mentioned, it's the business of life, right? So it's personal and professional, right? So if we look at the personal context, right, of some of the most effective strategies that you have in your, your personal life, I know it's all connected, but what would you say is one of those strategies for you personally that you think is so important for success? Well, um, probably the most important thing that I learned the hard way is going back to boundaries, you know, creating, maintaining, and consistently enforcing healthy boundaries, and then respecting others' healthy boundaries. Right. I think that that's very key because that's the way you build really strong relationships and strong relationships personally and professionally result in success. Right. And having that respect, right? And, and living with integrity and ethics and all the rest of it, which includes having appropriate boundaries, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, to me, um, integrity is really important. And integrity comes from integer, which means whole. So by implication, integrity means your integrity governs every aspect of your life because that's where the word comes from. And you know, as I say in my book, there are three types of integrity. There's the Machiavellian ends justify the means integrity, which politicians worldwide seem to specialize in. There, which one wouldn't say is integrity because that's situational. It's constantly changing based on what's in your best interests. The other one is golden rule integrity, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which by the way, isn't just a Christian dogma. It's in every religion and culture throughout the world. Yep. And then the last one is the Polonius Hamlet, Shakespearean integrity, which is to, to thine own self be true, so you'll be true to all others. Which to me, it goes back to my comment about the most important relationship is with yourself. Because to thine own self be true is really, really important. And if you are true to yourself and you've mastered you from the inside out, then you can have great relationships and be successful. And then you can, you love this segue, lead and inspire, <laughs> which is the L in the build framework. So how do you lead and inspire in all that you do? First step is to thine own self be true. There you if go. If you don't BS yourself, you're not going to BS others. If you BS yourself, you're going to BS others, right? So when everybody sees you have integrity, and you're being truthful about who and what you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are, and you lead through courage, determination, persistence, never say die. You hold yourself accountable equally to the same standard that you hold everyone else. People will follow you, especially when it's you. I love the analogy in your book where you're talking about everybody in the everybody in the boat pulling the oars the same direction, the same speed where you, and I forget what it was, debate something and decide. Discuss, debate, you, you, decide and align and act in alignment, right? right. The three D's yeah. in the name, so right? When you come out of the room, you come out of the room, hopefully, and there were no passive aggressives in there, which is a problem if there are, you come out of the room, by definition, the group decided. And it wasn't any one person's decision. So, yeah, absolutely concur on that one. Right. So lead and inspire is, the way I did it at Cyberonics is, you know, okay, whenever there was trouble, I was the tip of the spear, which with hindsight wasn't always a great idea. But people <laughs> saw my courage and they said, 
And I just basically said, hey, don't be afraid. We can do this. And I'll be the tip of the spear. We're going to have this plan of a series of small steps. But we constantly got together, JP, to plan and to evaluate our performance and change the plan if necessary. Well, what I always said to people is, look, check out your titles and your egos at the door. We're all equals in here. And when we come out of this with a decision, it's our decision, not my decision, not somebody else's decision. It's our decision. Equal buy-in leads to equal commitment, equal passion, and equal results. Right. And then equal credit in a way, too, because everyone feels literally like they did it together. And that's because they did. Right. One of the great definitions of leadership is that when people figure out that they did it themselves. Right. And that's a true leader because you help them to understand that they have that ability within them. Yep, exactly. Right. Which, of course, leads to delivering excellence. So um, there's so many ways to define excellence, so many ways you actually portray excellence in your life, I know. What, what would you say to our audience today about delivering excellence and what you can put in place to make sure that, that we are all delivering excellence in, in what we do? Well, I think in order to deliver excellence, you have to walk your talk and mean what you say and do and vice versa. Oh wait, so you mean lead and inspire leads to delivering excellence? Oh, if only someone would have thought of this. <laughs> exactly. I know. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's this whole concept of build. Yeah, exactly. You know, came down from the sky. <laughs> there you go. So that is a, so important though, right? Yeah, so walk your talk, continue. Yeah, so walk your talk, um, mean what you say and do and vice versa. And as I say in my book, um, deliver on your promises. Yep. This is where it gets a bit tricky because what's the definition of promise? Yeah, I remember that. And it's like, there, there's not really different levels, right? It's, you say something, it's what they heard, right? And what and, they And think, when you right? think about it, what's a, what is a promise? That's an expectation. You got it. That your words or deeds created in others. It's not you saying, oh, I promise, or, you know, m maybe I'll be home early, you know, to go out and play baseball with you or whatever. Uh-uh. No, it's whatever the person watching you or listening to you defines as an expectation is a promise. So you have to be very careful about the promises you're making to people, which means the expectations you're creating in them. And excellence is consistently delivering on your promises. Right. Gotcha. And how do you strategically have a plan in place to make sure that that happens more often than not? Um, well, here we go. We go back to the inputs, right? So you create this plan in your personal or professional life. And you, you one of the things I like to say, I ask people, I say, oh, have you heard the old adage, you know, uh, plan your work and work your plan. People are like, Oh yeah, of course. Well, how about plan your life right. and live your plan? Oh no, I haven't heard that one. And why is it the people are so good at planning in their business and their personal life is a disaster? Exactly. You know, they have no plan to accumulate generational wealth. Okay. Guilty is charged. Well, you had a plan. It just fell apart. Now, now you're planning again. <laughs> yeah, I just ignored it. Yeah, I That's just right. ignored it. I had a plan, but I just ignored it. I didn't frequently measure or report it, whatever. So, you know, if I only knew then what I know now. But yeah, you know, have, the, have a plan that everybody has bought into, that everybody's measuring, everybody is reporting, and everybody understands the rewards or the consequences as a group. Right. And that's excellence, you know, it's just really hitting it. That's hard excellence. And, and Consistently delivering on the promises that you made to yourself and to all of those with whom you have a relationship, personally or professionally. And having a plan to make it happen. And without a plan, it's only a dream. That's right. Love it. I always say, you know, Hope is not a strategy. Wishing won't make it so, right? It takes intention exactly. and action, right? You have to go after it. Well, think, think about think about plan with your beloved that you're in a relationship with. Yep. What plan do you share with each other 
to keep that relationship fresh and growing. Like, okay, a lot of young couples say, oh, let's have a couple of kids. Wait, wait, are, are you sufficiently scalable? Is your relationship scalable? Are you financially scalable to have a couple of kids and be successful parents while at the same time you're you know, maintaining and building and keeping your relationship fresh? Hmm. My, my experience says it's a lot harder than people think. Or, oh, yeah, we need a bigger new house. We need a five-bedroom house for three people. Uh, really? Are you sufficiently scalable financially to do that? And you go back to having children. It's like, okay, well, who, who's going to quit their job? And what impact does that have on you financially? So I think life plans and relationship plans are every bit as important as plans in business. Absolutely. Now, all comes down to, as you're talking about, open communication, right? And having the conversation so you have the awareness of these things you want to, as I say, shine the light on, right? So you're actually addressing them with mindfulness, intention, and planning so that you can deliver excellence in your life. And the thing is, JP, you said, okay, well, having the conversations, that's great. But if it, if it isn't in writing, memories have a funny way of getting a little hazy every now and then. You know what I mean? So like when my, uh, I talk about her a lot in my, in my book, my uh, second wife, Baiba, uh, we've recently gotten back together and it's because I wrote the book and Bible realized, oh, okay, he's wised up. <laughs> right. Congratulations, by the way. That's that. That's not in the book, right? <laughs> because it happened after the no, book. It's so another, the book. Another benefit of that, right? Yeah, it's exactly. It's the sequel. But anyway, um, so what did we do? We followed the advice in the book. We created a relationship agreement and we created a relationship plan for how we're gonna keep the relationship fresh and growing. You know, one of the things that, that um, I observed in my study of Tantra yoga is a lot of couples don't write down the definition of cheating. So it's different for everyone, right? For one person it's this, for one for person it's that, and there's the disconnect. Right. Exactly. So if you don't write it down, you can assume a lot, right? And my old linebacker coach used to say, how do you spell assume? That's uh, out of you and oh. me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, that's really important because what does constitute cheating? Yeah. I mean, you got to write it down and you got to consider all the things. Okay. Sharing emotional energies, you know, sharing, you know, of course, having sex is, that's cheating. Well, in some relationships, maybe it isn't. Because, you know, if I, you have an open relationship, but you got to write down those boundaries and those rules of the road. So everyone in the relationship keeps driving on the road. Right. So excellence is about, yeah, formalizing your understandings too, right? In a very, you know, kind of right. documented way, right? <laughs> so that people understand what it is that you're saying and what and it is your expectations what, are. Where are you going to spend your money? When are you going to buy a new house? When are you going to buy a new car? What kind of savings are you going to do? What investments are you going to make? Who's going to pay for what expenses? It's all really important stuff. Yep, 100%. And, and plans that aren't written down, again, are you know just pipe dreams. That's right. And being aligned is so important, and the plans help you get aligned. So, look, um, we could talk all day. I know that. Um, before we close, I mean, any final words of wisdom that you wanted to share that you haven't shared so far with our audience here today? Uh, all I would say is if ever there was a time to master you from the inside out, it's now <clears throat> because the list of powerful outside forces worldwide that are trying to master all of us from the outside in are overwhelming. And so, speaking of that, how can people get a hold of you? How can they reach out if they want to know more about your services, how you can help them master themselves from the inside out? Uh, go to my website, www.skipcummins.com. And there you'll find my email and you'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, sinus infection, not COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got tested. I know it's not that. So anyway, um, go to my website, www.skipcummins.com. There you'll see my email and you'll see my phone number. So right. have a look. 
figure out how I can help you, how I can share with you what everything I know now that I wish I knew then. So you don't have to make the mistakes yourselves and uh, or give me a call. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. We will definitely stay connected. I know that we will. Uh, thank all of you for joining us here as well. For more great resources to help you become your best self, including free worksheets and downloads, make sure to check out thebuildframework.com. That's it for this episode. I'm JP. We'll see you next time on The Build Show.